Hi, welcome to the Semantics Lecture Lab, introducing argument structure. The argument structure of a predicate is simply the nature of the arguments that it requires and its interaction with the syntax. And of course, in this course, we'll be focusing on its semantic effects, but the syntax will never be far away. And we'll be using them uh, to learn about each other. So when we talk about argument structure, we're going to focus on verbs. Verbs aren't the only expressions with arguments, either in the semantics or the syntax. Uh, but we're going to focus on them in that sense. And generally, when people talk about argument structure, we mean verbs. Now, verbs are um, easily classified. We've seen them in, classified for axioms art, for instance. But we can also classify them by what's called their valency or, or their valence. Uh, essentially, the number of arguments that they have. So uh, some verbs have no arguments at all, and these are called ambient or impersonal verbs. Some have one argument, those are the intransitives. Some have two, those are the transitives. And some have three, these are called ditransitives. And um, you know, a lot of verbs are lexically selected uh, for transitivity, and uh, some are not. And so in a lot of languages, we get alternations. So for instance, in English, we have the verb break, which is transitive, or break off, which is another transitive. And uh, we can alternate that verb to have different versions that have different valences. So it's the transitive case. Uh, Tom broke off a piece of the Kit Kat. Um, but we can have an intransitive version, a piece of the Kit Kat broke off. And we can also have a ditransitive version. Tom broke me off a piece of the Kit Kat. And so in English, we can get this alternation without any special difference in morphology. It's a zero alternation. But in a lot of languages, there is special morphology, sometimes to make the verb transitive and sometimes to make it int intransitive. Excuse me. Um, there's also a wide variety of morph morphemes that affect the valence. So a number of them add to the uh, add arguments, and a number of them uh, remove arguments. So adding arguments, the most uh, well-known ones are causatives and duplicatives. And causatives simply take an, uh, a verb and require an additional argument. So uh, just a classic case from Turkish. If you say Ahmet öldü, this is Ahmet died, straightforward. If we... Um, Oh, if we say Ahmed El Durdun. Here we've added the causative suffix, in this case dur. And this is first person singular now. So this would be I made Ahmed die. And in English we'd have a lexical verb kill that would replace this. But we don't have that here. And we can change this predicate out here. It's dance, but we can we can even make it a transitive verb. So I could make Ahmed uh, kill Ali, etc. You know, it doesn't really matter. Um, but what matters is that this affix takes this intransitive verb, which takes one argument, and makes it a transitive. It can take a transitive and make it a ditransitive. Um, now, another good example is uh, the applicative. The applicative is, was first uh, noticed in African languages, but it's been found all over the world. A great example is this one from Chichewa. Uh, the lion cooked beans. Pretty straightforward. Um, well, I mean, except for the silliness of the scenario, perhaps. Uh, unless, perhaps it's a mythical scenario. But the lion cooked beans. But if we want to... Uh, add the line cooked beans for the children. In English, we'd use the prepositional phrase. But in Chichewa, uh, you add the applicative to the verb, and it makes the transitive a ditransitive by adding an oblique. And the applicative does that. It adds an oblique argument. The causative adds an extra agent. The applicative adds an oblique. So that's a, another example of valence adding morphology. There's also valence reducing morphology. And this morphology is typically called voice morphology. A classic example is the passive. The passive takes uh, a transitive and makes it intransitive 
by taking away its agent. So um, uh, John killed uh, the banker, um, can become the banker was killed. In a lot of languages, passives can be applied to intransitives, and it takes them from having one argument to having none, to being an impersonal. Uh, <clears throat> there are other examples of voice morphology that we'll talk about later. Now, so we have valence, right? We have these different uh, concepts of valence. Different verbs will have different structures and um, get reflected in different ways. A lot of languages have morphology on the nouns that, ref that interacts with this as well. The most obvious one is what's called ergativity. Ergative languages are those where the case marking varies based on the valence of the verb. So in English, or you know, in say uh, German or Latin languages you're probably familiar with, there is nominative case for subjects and accusative case for objects. And it doesn't matter what the valence of the verb is, nominative will be for subjects in a finite clause. But in an ergative absolutive language, it's different. So for if the if the verb has a subject and an object, then the subject will be marked with ergative and the what's called ergative, and the object will be marked with absolutive. But if there's just a subject and no object, so the intransitive, then the then the noun is marked the that single noun is marked with the absolutive, the same as the object case. So there's a distinction there that we don't get in you know, what are called nominative accusative languages. The ergative accusative languages found all over the world. Maybe the most well-known example is uh, Yushkara or Basque uh, because it's spoken in Europe. And there's examples uh, in the handout. So that you know, that's uh, one. You know, so that that's basically a very <laughs> bare bones introduction to valence and to argument structure. And we'll have a few more lecture lights that go into some of these issues, uh, talking about voice and so forth. And uh, we will continue to look at how this transitivity and how this, well, how this valence interacts with the different arguments that a verb can have.